sure we're all part of the system, you know, we're, we're into it. But I think if you're going to make it within that system, you know, you've got to use your own mind. The right for their society, it's what Niebuhr talks about, as the individual morality. Okay, then you're in the in situation of being faced with the problem of does the end of the highest value on your pyramid, for example, um, belief in the United States, the code of conduct, my religion, uh, in the case of Abraham, the word of God, does this, as an end, justify any means to secure it? Uh, but you're saying you're saying there is. It's immoral to kill. It's immoral right. to take somebody else's life, that's no matter it, what. Now, yeah. okay. if you said, you've got you to you use that assumption. You think that Camus, uh, Camus would deny that there can be a quality of personal experience, or you'd have to necessarily deny a morality, personal morality. It's like uh, one thing that Bath picked up completely: the uh, no judgment clause. Kind of nobody can judge your standards except you. Very good, Mr. Showers. Mr. Rudd, stand up straight. It's the last time you've washed that cap cover. Week go Tuesday, sir. I thought so, Mr. Rudd. It's gross. The shoes. When's the last time you polished them, Mr. Rudd? Three days ago, sir. Mr. Rudd, you know you're supposed to polish them every day, right? Yes, sir. After morning meal, right? Yes, sir. Why didn't you do so? No excuse, sir. Darn right there isn't, Mr. Rudd. The menu for new meal is French onion soup and cheese croutons, cold roast beef salad. Oh, man. Cold potato salad. You know, it's like a of them. <laughs> this particular sermon that's coming up is really going to be a... Uh, a challenge to our, our class because our way back when when we were plebes, you hear that all the time when we were plebes. But uh, it was more or less physical when when uh, we were here in, that one summer. And uh, this one coming up, it's it's a complete transition from physical harassment to uh, mental motivation. I mean, instead of uh, dropping the guy for you know remember his, the ten push-ups, it's uh, you got to work more or less to the positive motivation aspects. There's a little bit of disagreement there. A lot of guys really favored uh, going back to the hard-nosed tactics, you know, uh, more physical than get it for ten motivation. How about just like a hard plead summer rather than a, you know the hard year? I think that I favor that. I, I I make sure I cover two things when I'm when I'm talking, and one of them is motivation, and that covers that. You know, I tell the guy he won't like it here, and it's you just can't like it here unless you want it, right. you know, unless, unless you can see what you're getting out of it. I think the guy that comes here wanting a free education. We'll leave so in about man. two weeks, because he'll yeah, find out. Yeah, he's the one that's going to leave. Same thing with the guy that just comes here to get out of the draft. Yeah. I can, I've never heard anything of the guy that says, come here to get out of the draft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's the big thing this summer, Joey. We were talking about, you know, professionals and things. The, the, dis the time discipline, you know. The ability to, to figure out what you got to get done and realize it's impossible to get it done in the amount of time you got it to do it in, and then get it done in that amount of time. What I'm saying is that because of the varsity court, I think you should be prepared to give yours at the time given. If you can't, then you better work it out with someone else in an equitable arrangement right. with them. Okay, fine. Okay? Right. That's fine. Okay, I hope you didn't get that on tape. And uh, in each midshipman, I don't care whether he's the star halfback or the stroke of the crew or whatever, he must maintain a satisfactory academic average. Everything that everybody else does, the athlete does as well. assets of the Naval Academy is the fact that everybody must participate in some sort of a sport, be it intercollegiate or intramural. And uh, well, you can hear behind me right here, you can, you can see these guys really getting involved in a sport. None of these guys are really great athletes, but they're, they're involved in, in the competitive sport. And it, it brings out certain feelings inside themselves that they really never have experienced before. The Academy is the only place I know where you can go out any hour of the day and find somebody out running just for the fun of it. We're gambling and teaching a person to be a thinker, an intellectual of some sort, so broadly 
experienced man is, is going to pay off, rather than the narrow, essentially professional, practical courses. And I don't think any one of us here would claim to know that that gamble is going to work at this stage. Here we've gone from a strictly, a very strictly structured curriculum designed to produce professional naval officers to a very flexible curriculum in which, personally, I think the academics has been overemphasized. But I do think there's a correlation between uh, reaching the higher ranks and, and working to acquire a broader knowledge. These people will graduate from here and they will serve, aside from serving in military, strictly in military capacity, they will also serve on joint, on joint staffs. They've got to know about the Russians, they've got to know about the Europeans, and they've got to know. This may very well be the last time that they'll get a course like this before they have such duty. That's wonderful, that's fine, he'll get a nice port background, but will it be of benefit to the Navy? This is a military school, and lots of people forget that. If you were Harvard, you'd get the same theory and so forth with different examples. The emphasis comes more from our way of life and the context in which we teach it rather than what we teach. It is possible for me as a naval officer to get postgraduate work in oceanography in which I would specialize in uh, oceanography and then possibly go into research work. No matter what their major is, they all turn out to be really majoring in being an officer. Uh, why can't we at the Naval Academy produce, in addition to the professional naval officer, a professional naval officer who has a acknowledged degree of expertise in the field of management. Wonderful, but our object isn't to train a professional physicist, it's to train a naval officer. Well, if we can make him feel that a naval career is not, you might say, antithetical to scholarship in a variety of areas, and to real intellectual advance, why, all the better for us and the Navy. The, the Navy, in recent years, has felt that the Naval Academy ideally should graduate approximately 70 percent of its graduates in the engineering math science fields. Uh, up until this point we have allowed virtually free choice and the choices have fortunately come quite close to those percentages. And I, evidently you can speak to uh, anyone, you know, anyone of authority, of higher authority than myself, that mathematics and science are going to be the mainstay here in order to, to, to function. But Somehow or other, we've got to get it across to them that this will be very vital to them at some time in the future. He doesn't have to be a technician, but he should at least be able to understand the language of his, of his men. I think it's essential that they be trained within a military environment. This is the career they're going into. Uh, our mission is to send these men to the fleet. <laughs> Everyone will have his version of whether we're succeeding or whether uh, there is too much professional orientation or too much academic orientation, probably according to his uh, background. Now, I'm 1st Regimental Commander, and as such, uh, I'm also a Brigade Operations Officer. As far as responsibility goes, I think your first class year, one of the biggest responsibilities you can have is being a squad leader which is just a one-strike position. But at that level, you have personal contact with your second, third, and fourth classmen. On my level, I'm lucky if I get that contact. It's not there. I've, I've got to go out. You know, I've got to get among people to, to find out how they feel about stuff, see? that are stabilized are going to be farther away right now at this point in time and then toward the middle you're going to have the quasars and then toward the middle farther you're going to have something that we no, don't see. No, no, absolutely not. Why not? I'll show you why not. Can I erase this? Okay. I'm going to redraw it on a bigger scale. Uh, smaller scale. Right, here we are with all these little knots, you see, all of them. Here are all the proto-galaxies. Let's, just, let's say they're all the same age, okay? And they're all going wham, biff, bam, and so on. And the whole thing is expanding uniformly. So now let's take a few representative ones. One in the middle and a couple out of... And let's assume they all evolve at the same rate. Right. 
Okay, all right. All right. So now this thing expands, and uh, in umpty ump years. Wanga ha be Mississippi ha Changa. Wanga. Wanga. Uh, you say Hong Kong or Mississippi? What is Hong Kong? Hong Kong. 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 And basically, this is the distinction between the phase modulation system and the frequency modulation system. In the one case, the variation in the, in the angle is proportional to... Academics the is a very itself. important case, thing here because it consumes all your time. 90% of your time is spent in academics. Whereas at a regular college, you'd take perhaps 15, 16 hours. The average course load at the Naval Academy is 18. Or differentiation. Try the conversation. And it went, uh, all right, you guys ready to go? Yeah, we're ready to go, you know. But then all of a sudden, we got plenty of characters. The engineering and science curriculum that we get is basic. That's what the Navy needs, is engineers, not poets. A lot of people don't like that. I find I've been able to balance, balance both. Comment. I don't know. I would like to see that um, with the characters somehow more individualized than they are. You know, when you said individualize the characters, though, that's what I do with the conversation. And uh, here they thought that uh, we were uh, making a limited uh, 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 drive. Basically five ways you can go from the academy. If you're motivated towards infantry, you can go Marine Corps. It's got everything to offer in that respect. If you like air, you can fly. It's the best pilots in the world. If you like uh, submarines or technological type professions, you've got the nuclear power program. And of course, if you like the sea and like the open air, you've got wine convinced that this was a temporary operation. Or what I'm trying to develop here is a rotor blade that's flexible. You can roll it up on a drum and also develop one that's stable. The problem you run into with a blade of this type is that it's also flexible in torsion. When you start up the blade, you can see how flexible it is right at the beginning. At the low RPMs, we can see it fairly well, but once you get up into the operating range of 400 to 600 RPM, it becomes pretty much of a blur. How do I get this together? How do I, upon whom do I rely for these decisions? Politician will make... Um there's a lot of ad hoc activities that I participate in. I was at a conference last weekend with other students and, and professional people from Washington on national security. Next week I'm going to Texas for a, a seminar on the university. Be, uh, I think it's going to be the scientist who makes the decision and the, and the political scientist who uh, gives it his endorsement. No, it's, it's the political scientist who determines who, where the money's going to go, the research money. Well, he, the political scientist can't make a decision on something technological because he has no, he doesn't, just doesn't have the background. So he'll have to receive the inputs from uh, these guys before he can implement any kind of position or policy. We stay wise at 11 degrees. Minus 0.7. 7.5. Minus 20.7, minus 0.2, minus 0.1, zero. The reason we only had two divisions, wasn't there some type of agreement that we would supply uh, so many troops and that they would back them up with so much, and really it was just an agreement, but th as to why we only had two divisions. There's more concern for the individual here, more concern. I know of very few places uh, where you can call a professor even at home, as you can here, and they'll, they'll uh, counsel you, help you with whatever problem you have. And they make it, it's a free and open invitation. If you do definitely have a problem, they have no qualms about you calling, calling at home. Only in, in rudimentary form are we talking about NATO or common market or Soviet response to either one of them through a Warsaw Pact. Remember, this really doesn't get off the ground until 1955. Get ready to take your readings, and Mr. Capra, you get ready to uh, move the probe. I found that 
I think the Naval Academy probably has some of the best facilities of any school around, and they're constantly modernizing them. This gives us the data to get an axial plot in order to find the material buckling. What's the vertical reading there now? That's where we started. Much like, uh, say, the Confucians and uh, the people of China and Japan and people that we studied before, I think that, uh, that even more so the Africans have developed this family feeling more of, uh, of their history than anything else. Yes, feeling is the word. You have certain amounts of time that you have to put to study use. You can't study when you want, say, you can't read a book all night. You can't read a book from cover to cover and get the essential theme of that book for one course because you've just got too much to do. It pulls this up over the top and it's just about impossible to get to. Uh, the stone crab will just break off chunks of the shell until it can get to the soft meat. Another uh, predator is the common seagull. Point five four. What was that? Nine point five. Nine point five. Four on a strut. Four on a strut. Okay. Get a wave height. Wave height. Hey, you're pretty good at that. <laughs> that right. eight quarters. Constant eight twenty. You're good. Point eight knots. Point seven five. Okay. Seven five. What was the wave height? It would be. You're 6,000 yards from the guide, or from the center of the formation, 120 degrees relative to what? Formation axis. 120 degrees relative to the formation axis. Formations normally have a formation axis. They would also have a formation course, a formation speed. Many times the formation course is not the same as the formation axis, so you have to be careful. When you're stationing your ship in a formation, you station relative to the formation Right now the uh, freshmen, sophomores, and, and juniors all have classes that directly involve uh, use of the YPs. It takes the, the practical, uh, the theoretical knowledge that we've learned in the classroom and, and makes it come alive out on the bay. And as plebes, they get their basics indoctrination on the YPs. Uh, from this point on, they'll go into navigation. They'll navigate the YPs on the bay. And during second class summer, they'll be involved in advanced tactics, in which case they'll make a cruise to Little, Little Creek, Virginia and return. Well, the YP squadron is an extracurricular activity. And so this is comprised of those individuals who desire additional time on the YPs and they're organized into a ship's company so to speak and they spend their afternoons here on the on the Severn and in the Chesapeake. If you're command qualified you're uh, you're able to take a boat out onto the bay without any supervision of any kind. No there will be no officers on board or, or senior people at all. We're completely responsible for the, the ship and her crew. We do a lot of the, uh, the tactical maneuvers that the ships in the fleet do use. We actually get a feel, not, not for what a formation should look like, but actually how to, once you're in that formation, to stay in the formation without drifting too far off station. I really do think that the YP squadron gets a person ready to go to the fleet, be it on a summer cruise or after graduation. And it, it definitely is an advantage on summer cruise to have been a member of the YP squadron. I don't, I don't know of anyone in the YP squadron that got below the grade of A on their cruise. The summer cruise basically allows you to live the life as both enlisted and as officers. Well, the anchor is weighed and the sails they are set. Away, away we go. The mates that we're leaving will never forget. The uh, youngster cruise is to uh, show you the lot of the enlisted man in that you do his functions, stand his watches, and actually work with an enlisted man. Really, the summer cruises tie together all the professional training that you have here at the academy. 
is that a large amount of your time is spent in navigation, naval science, engineering, and mathematics. First class cruise is different in as, insofar as you are treated as an officer and uh, have the responsibilities of an officer. And first class cruise was tremendous. I was in the Mediterranean and I saw just about every other ship in the Med. I saw quite a few interesting ports and it was really well worth it. We had a five days off in New Zealand, uh, a week off in Australia and three days in Hawaii. And third class year I went to uh, England and Germany. That was just fantastic. To be a professional officer, you have to be have to have some knowledge of the sea and be able to make decisions. In a in sailboat racing, you know, there's no better way to learn about the weather, learn about sea conditions, learn about what what can happen while you're out there, uh, what the sea can do in a short time. Sail, Warren. Come on, grind. Stuff gets the shroud. Come on, grind. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Grind it. Jess, will you tell Jerry I want to know where the mark is? Come on, half close. Pull it. Heavens a lee. We feel that the uh, sailing at the Naval Academy uh, is a very essential element in developing the capabilities we're looking for in a naval officer. I just wish that we had more of an opportunity to work longer hours uh, with all the midshipmen. Of course, we're competing with all of the sports here at the Naval Academy, uh, the whole uh, list of 20-odd varsity sports. You, get, you can get really into a sport at the Naval Academy. You've got four years to play it to practice it, and you practice it five days a week in most cases, if you're on a varsity or a junior varsity level. And uh, it becomes a very important part of your life to many, many people here. Physical activity you know, helps you study better at night. That's for me anyway, helps me sleep better and everything else. I mean, the maybe a little less, more time in the afternoons could be devoted to academics an entire afternoon, basically, intramurals from about 3.15, 4 o'clock to about 6.30 is all sports. Well, you get out in the afternoon, you get to get rid of all your tensions. And psychologically, athletics, I think, is really good for a person because you get to get rid of all the tensions in your body, physical and mental, and emotional sometimes. Playing a tennis match or playing a football game or a basketball game is the same thing as taking that test taking that final exam you have to you have to apply it under pressure and you're learning that here for the type of life that a midshipman leads in Bancroft Hall where, where his life is centered here at the Academy rather than out in a college town where he has evenings that he can go off into town and uh, express himself in various ways why well, I think to a to a midshipman uh, that athletics are more important it just has to be more important that's a restricted life there's no getting away from that it's the military and it's a place where they take away all your God-given rights, they say, plebe year, and give them back to you one at a time as privileges. Yes, as far as comparing the Naval Academy against other civilian colleges and universities, certainly. He lives a regimented life. Uh, five days a week, he's under pretty rigid control. But on the other hand, these midshipmen do have all sorts of opportunities to enjoy much the same sort of social and extracurricular life that their counterparts in civilian schools do. 
weekends are pretty much free. I think uh, the whole spirit and mood of the academy has grown more relaxed in recent years in terms of allowing them to indulge in certainly the extracurricular activities that would be found on almost any other campus. And by the time you're first class, as I am, you got, you have no problems and we can take off. We have recreational liberty at night and I can take off and go into town just about any time I want. And with the, the reforms that have come about as far as first class go, I can leave three out of four weekends. Well, I think we believe that in order to attract the best students we could find in this country and bring them to the academy, we had to offer a, a program that was more varied than the standard curriculum. I think the Navy also felt that uh, there just there were too many varieties of careers available to midshipmen. There were too many possibilities open to them to uh, really feel that one curriculum would serve the needs of the Navy or the needs of our incoming midshipmen in all cases. Uh, perhaps I won't be in ship design. Maybe I'll be in weapons design or uh, people engineering. Uh, I'm not sure yet. But I feel that there have to be some people in the Navy with a little bit of know-how that they can correct the situations as they exist now. And right now I'm really looking forward to going to Pensacola because I got a great feeling for Navy Air right now and I really love to fly. Well, I'm going Marines. I've always wanted that. I'm assigned right now to a, a missile ship in Mayport, Florida. That was my first choice. I want to go submarines, which means I'll be going to nuclear power school. I selected surface line as my, as my specialty. There's a tremendous amount of fun associated with being a member of the brigade. A lot more so than people like to admit. And I think most of them realize it when it's just about over. You know, it's a, it grabs you after four years. But there's so much sweat and hard work, and it's goodbye. <laughs>